Okay, so hi, hi everyone. Welcome back uh, to this uh, amazing meeting. Uh, now we'll we'll get into a, a wonderful session. Is uh, developing diagnostics and therapeutics. So um, with uh, some good friends actually, and uh, we're meeting through the the, the, the web. And uh, so the first uh, talk by will be by Natalie Strabugard. Uh, she is director of neglected tropical diseases at the NDI. And she is now coordinating COVID, uh, COVID uh, response. Will be followed by by uh, Jens uh, Lundgren, who is actually he has many, he is a professor in the Copenhagen University, but he's also the director of the Active Three and the lead of uh, Active Three uh, clinical trials uh, network. And then we will end by with Sergio Carmona, who's also a good friend, and he's now the CEO of Find. And so we hope, um, so the way this uh, session will work is that each of the speakers will give a, uh, its presentation. And then at the end of each presentation, we'll have room for maybe one really burning question if it exists. And, but otherwise we prefer to group all the questions at the end so that we can, we can have uh, a nice uh, dialogue between the, all of us. Uh, thank you very much. And please, Natalie, go ahead, thanks. Hello, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with colleagues who are deeply involved in the COVID response. So I'll try to present Antikov uh, and uh, highlight maybe the, uh, the efforts around repurposed drugs. So Antikov is uh, an adaptive platform clinical trial to test multiple COVID-19 early treatment options and minimize the need for hospitalization in resource-constrained settings worldwide. For now, we are conducting Anticov in 13 African countries and we are expanding into a study in India with ICMR and possibly with Brazil very soon. So what was the context? The context when the pandemic uh, was declared in March 2020, was that uh, there were already some reports coming from the UN showing that uh, if the pandemic was going to evolve as it was in, in Europe and in the US, it would be dramatic in terms of uh, health and costs and economics in, in Africa. There was this UN report. And the other piece of information which was clear was that if patients were to be hospitalized, there would not be enough beds. And this uh, graph on the left shows you the, uh, the situation of uh, ICU beds uh, in, uh, depending on the resource, um, economic resource. At the same time, uh, when we looked at what was happening in terms of clinical trials, you could see that efforts were already ongoing. That was uh, in, in, uh, in March. Uh, you could already see uh, around 300 clinical trials ongoing, but very, very, very few uh, in Africa. And despite this, WHO R&D blueprint had set up some very early uh, clinical uh, key priorities, one of which was to um, evaluate steroids and oxygen immediately to see if they could bring any benefit to patients, mostly hospitalized patients, but also develop master protocol that would help to find new therapeutics. The other piece was that uh, looking at the percentage of patients who were, how patients were evolving with the disease, it was reported that about 20% of patients would be hospitalized, out of which 2% would die, but about 80% would be either uh, mildly symptomatic or having mild uh, pneumonia, but not hospitalized and staying home. So we could see there was a gap and uh, to, to treat those patients, which if they were going to evolve would be dramatic, they could not be you know, treated and all that. So that's why we decided to focus on outpatients. And we also decided to uh, design uh, something that would allow us to be flexible and to incorporate uh, rapid uh, uh, treatments to allow for decision rapidly. And it was clear that using uh, repurposed drugs would be one of the immediate uh, short-term um, option and opportunity. We also said that we would probably have more evidence during the pandemic as it evolved, uh, more science coming and helping us to, to, to uh, 
um, determine what was the best treatment more thoroughly with more evidence. And then uh, because we looked at numbers, it was very clear for the UNI that we would not be able to do it alone. And at the same time, we had a lot of uh, partners, including, including IS Global, who were already thinking of um, you know, contributing to a response for, uh, for Africa because they had already worked there and they knew about the needs, the situation, the context and the gaps. And so very quickly we developed a consortium of different partners and we decided to develop a platform trial and to develop a TPP, which at that time was not existing. This slide is a very busy one, but the objective is to show you the, the, the fact that this consortium, which is quite big, the groups, different um, institutions from Africa and from Europe, uh, each playing a very complementary role, either in the inclusion of patients in the different countries, which are the vertical bars, but also some transversal coordination or joint activities amongst all partners, including for, for ICE Global and ITM leading and series studies to this platform trial looking at immune response and epidemiological impact, whilst the NDI is sort of coordinating uh, all of this. And this is, this is the project we're talking about. I won't spend too much time on this because it's not the purpose for today, but it's very important to understand that this, this platform now exists. And I think you know, we have to see how in the future, maybe it will have a value. Going back to what we decided, the first thing we did, which was critical, was to define a target product profile, which we did with the, with the, with the physician uh, of the endemic countries, uh, with the scientific uh, leaders and experts from North and South. So we decided on the indication. We had a lot of debate on the target population that as an ideal, um, uh, TPP and, and product, we wanted to be sure that um, uh, pregnant women and breastfeeding women would not be excluded. And that, that's not so simple. Um, we also, of course, focused on outpatients. You can see on the left side, the acceptable TPP, it had to be global. We decided on the efficacy, uh, the expected efficacy, which was a big debate, looking at whether hospitalization, which is a, a very well um, used um, outcome, would be valid in this context, it was found that it could be too much influenced by um, social conditions and, and uh, you know, prescription of everybody being hospitalized at the start and nobody being hospitalized or nobody having access to hospital, not enough. So we decided to look for a more objective criteria, which was based on oxygen saturation. In terms of safety, it was clear that we wanted no additional monitoring because you can't expect if you have to treat 80% of COVID uh, patients living at home, you don't want to have to bring them back for a lab, an ECG or whatever monitor. That would limit access. We also uh, thought about the potential um, other diseases that they might have and needed to make sure that they could be, drugs could be compatible. In terms of co-infections, uh, co we, we thought about lower and lower uh, when we started thinking about ivermectin because, as you know, you can't give uh, um, ivermectin in lower and lower uh, endemic areas in Africa. And then we discussed the group of administration, which is so key for this population. So most um, of the efforts, some of the efforts with the, uh, the new monoclonals are based on intra uh, intravenous infusion-based uh, therapies, which we found could not uh, work for our patients. So we decided to go for oral tablets or sub-Q or depot if it was only one injection. Then we decided on the um, dose uh, regimen uh, for, for the best treatment, which we thought should not exceed uh, seven to 10 days and uh, or two weeks, but uh, um, we didn't want to have too many frequent administration. It had to be something that can be given at home. And when we discussed inhaled uh, therapies, we, we discussed that administration through a mask would be um, okay. And last but not least, we discussed the price. So the discussion around price was based on benchmark for short course treatment, but we found that, you know, and, and this, this is a tricky point, but we are, you know, we looked at uh, ASAQ, which is for malaria, and we were thinking of access. So we, we decided for $10 regimen. Um, 
um, max, and of course, so that uh, it should be lower. And as you know, for now, the, the new drugs were not there, but that's something that's achievable uh, with repurposed drugs. So those were the key things. So why are we speaking about repurposed drugs? Well, you know, we come from, GNTI comes from the NTD world, and for NTD, it's been very clear that to start having something that works, uh, that you can save time on, repurposed drugs are the, one of the solutions. And we have good examples in, in the field of NTDs. But if you look at this slide, which was developed for a presentation at ASTMH based on you know, the need for NTDs, it's clear that when you start from here, of course, you have to go for this, this whole development chain, um, which takes time. And there's no way you can, you can accelerate, but you can't accelerate to, and compress to, to the need that would match um, what we expected the pandemic uh, being requiring. So when you start after phase one, you already know about the PK, you know about some of the safety events, and if it's repurposed and of, of a marketed drug, of course, you have a lot of data on safety. And that is quite critical if you think of benefit risk for outpatient population. Of course, you also have um, the chance, if it's been on the market for a long time, to be a gener generic drug, which you will have easier access to. Um, and uh, for regulators, it's much simpler. You just need to focus here on efficacy. So looking at the landscape uh, in 2020, that was, I'm sorry, you can't read it, but you can go back to the publication. It was looking at what was existing for uh, the research on COVID and a lot of this was based on repurposed drugs, not by surprise. Um, I did know one of our colleagues of the Antico Consortium also does a regular living systematic review. And if you look at the class of drugs here, they're not detailed, but you can see that a great majority was based on antimalarial, antibiotics, um, and, uh, and other drugs, which uh, are repurposed ones, and a few on, on new drugs, although it's not fully detailed here. So where are we with the need for, for, for so our current understanding of the COVID-19 history, natural history, was a bit difficult. So first we had all drugs that were tested for late stage, which we thought would work for early stage. And we now know that it doesn't work. Uh, we know that HCQ didn't work here, or I could say maybe another example, but uh, dexamethasone, you wouldn't give a dexamethasone at the early stage. We now know that, and it's not recommended. So when we, when we think about outpatients, the window where we will see them is probably at a time where they have a decreased um, a viral uh, replication and an increasing host inflammatory response, which if it's not controlled, will lead to the severe complications. So the idea is really to find something that would match those two mechanisms or those two phenomena, um, knowing that you will never know if a patient is uh, at uh, this stage or this stage, you know, between the yellow and the, uh, the pink uh, triangle. So you have to find something that combines the two mechanisms of action. This is why we've been looking at treatments that include an, an expected antiviral and an expected safe uh, anti-inflammatory. The other thing which needs to be taken into account is the future development of resistance that we need to think and prevent. So limiting, so on to how we select drugs for, for anti-cog, we have quite limiting uh, options. We have to look at an antiviral drug that has a mechanism of action and another one that has another mechanism of action, and then uh, an anti-inflammatory drug, which is, uh, which is safe. Uh, uh, but of course, being safe uh, means it doesn't have the, as it's not as potent, uh, most of the time it's related uh, in terms of anti-inflammatory activity. So looking at the um, potential for antivirals, we, we've been looking at amodiquine, tazoxanide, atazanavir, ritonavir, favipiravir, mefloquine, inhaled niplosamine. Uh, These were the first ones. And so we looked at uh, different combos of those uh, and uh, potential for, for use. The other um, potential uh, uh, criteria that we're looking at is also looking at uh, whether there is uh, lung exposure, what is the, is there proof of concept antiviral data, is there even clinical efficacy in patients, what do we know about the efficacy in severe patients, what, what do we know about the safety, and what about pregnancy. Um, and this was a, a, a sort of 
screening that we had in, uh, in June of 2020. And we moved on with a bit of more exploratory uh, PKPD, some hamster studies, some PKPD modeling um, that helped to refine our selection of drugs. Um, the other criteria that have contributed to the selection was, of course, the emerging clinical information. So this one is a copy, sorry, a copy of a slide um, we presented to our joint steering committee um, to look at what was, uh, was there evidence. And at some point you remember there was a lot of um, evidence for a, a positive effect of ivermectin in the uh, outcome of patients, even though the meta-analysis including included a lot of different patients, but overall there was kind of a signal that something was happening. Um, there was also uh, data from antiviral activity that came, uh, you know, over time, one on, uh, on ciclazonib, which was not confirmed, and uh, more recently, uh, bed to bench to bed um, uh, description of the potential effect of fluoxetine based on uh, an antiviral uh, mechanism via the FIASMA uh, mechanism. So those are the, the criteria. And lastly, of course, the safety very critical in outpatients. So, of course, uh, a repurposed drug has a safety that is well known um, uh, and, 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 you know, it's well documented. So when you go to regulators and you go to patients, you go to physicians, everybody is, is accepting this. Sometimes we have been using, and it's the case for nitazoxamide, a higher dose than the dose that is recommended. Uh, and for ivermectin, but there are some publications that justify that the dose we're using is safe, and for nitazoxanide, it's mostly based on, in fact, COVID studies. And the last thing we, we look at is whether or not we can uh, promote their use during pregnancy, which, which is not simple, but of course, it's easier with repurposed drugs than it would be with, uh, with new chemical entities. The last thing, the last two things we need to look at is, of course, the potential drug-drug interaction, which we can do based on the data we already know on these drugs and the way they are metabolized and interacting with others. And even you can do some modeling. And Liverpool has designed a really nice tool where you can look at the potential, I should have added this here, uh, potential for drug-drug interactions for COVID, really nice. Of course, the route of administration is also key. Uh, and then last, piece, which is um, not a purely scientific one, but such a critical one, is what are the options for, for access? And uh, in this effort, we are helped, we are the um, UNITED uh, work stream, UNITED leading the work stream two of the uh, ACTA therapeutics pillar, which is looking at uh, regulatory status, pricing, uh, ease of distribution, supply availability, IP issues, um, and, uh, and generic manufacturers, which can help to make sure that if you select something, that drug will be accessible to patients. So almost a uh, final slide here where we are today. We have this morning 640 patients. Um, and in terms of, you can see that the, the different colors here are different countries. And you can see that they started at different time points. That's also something to be discussed, maybe not here, but you know, the, the difficulties we've had to start in each country. Looking more at the therapeutics uh, where we are, so we started with HCQ and boosted uh, lopinavir, litonavir. The boosted uh, element came from modeling that showed that if you boost uh, lopinavir, you uh, on day one will reach um, uh, the EC90 that would, you would not reach before day three. So it's so critical if you want to have an antiviral efficacy. We then had to stop both arms due to the WHO recommendation in December of 2020. And then we introduced metazoxanide in combination with inhaled ciclazonide in April of 2021. Later, uh, ASAQ and uh, ivermectin, um, so ASAQ for the expected antiviral efficacy of amodiaquine and ivermectin for potential anti-inflammatory activity rather than uh, purely antiviral. And we hope to introduce soon a new arm with fluoxetine for an expected antiviral and potentially anti-inflammatory activity with inhaled desonide. So uh, lastly, um, where are we in terms of outpatients uh, recent results? So we 
probably all know very well the bibesonide, inhaled bibesonide uh, results from the, um, I put stoic, but I should have put, sorry, uh, I wanted to show the principal study results, sorry for that. Um, uh, from Chris Butler, who did show a positive protective effect and improving um, uh, the symptomatology of patients um, over, over uh, control. And then the very recent result of Tivoxamine in from the TOGETHER trial in, um, in, in Brazil, showing a very protective effect of, on hospitalization of uh, six hours of hospitalization with Tivoxamine, which is an SSRI. Those two treatments, and sorry again for the wrong, um, even though it's a good uh, publication, it's not the one I wanted to show. None of those two treatments are yet recommended, although those two treatments have a lot of safety data and have some, some information. So they are currently being reviewed uh, and they are repurposed for us. Now, in terms of those who are and have now received approval, so on the left side, you have a new um, uh, written cough, uh, monoclonal cocktail, which is very uh, efficacious, but an infusion and quite an expensive one for now. And on the right side, you have the very recent last week's um, uh, approval of Molnupiravir, which will be requiring some, uh, they mentioned that it's, it's conditional approval and maybe some follow-up. So this is where we are in terms of solutions. So we are not there because we go back to the TPP and uh, you know we, we still need those uh, easy to use, safe, effective, or uh, ideally and affordable treatments. So in conclusion, I think we all agree that the pandemic response requires really rapid evidence generation with uh, the partners. We designed a study that is um, supposed to be able to respond to the, via the, the adaptive platform design. For our patients, the benefit risk ratio requires very safe treatments. So repurpose drugs do carry the advantage of saving time to access based on what we've said before. I, I just want to say one word about the challenge with COVID that has been to have predictive um, uh, animal models. I could not detail here, but sometimes, you know, it's, it, it hasn't been very simple, but it's been progressing and that's really good because it helps us maybe for the future. But we've also been a bit, um, um, not biased, but there's been some, a lot of unconclusive evidence out there, which is quite difficult to summarize and make sense of. Mm. So having robust clinical trials is quite important. And, uh, and the design we have, I think, will help us for the future. And I will conclude here to say that we are still learning and you know, maybe uh, we'll, we'll meet again to understand how, how we've done and what lessons we can draw. That's it for me. Thank so, you very so much. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, we took some time from the we took some time from the questions, so no, no. So we'll have uh, we changed a little bit the plan. So we will ask the questions at the end of each presenter. This is how it was uh, the conference was designed. So we have time for a couple of questions. Um, Jens, uh, Sergio, if you want to ask uh, any question, um, I'll give the floor to you. I, I will ask. Also, so the first question is, we have a new antiviral for COVID, Molnupiravir. Do you think we will need to come up with combination of drugs to avoid the virus becoming resistant? I think it's a very important question to which I don't have a solid answer. I, you know, the community thinks that the, anti, the experts that have been working in the field of, uh, of viral diseases all say yes, we will need it. The question is when, and, and the question is how do you get to developing those new uh, antivirals, but I think it's difficult to think we would not. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, Sergio or Jens, do you have any, any questions? You want to ask any questions? I, I think it's, I mean, uh, one thing we know, and, and I think this leads to also vaccines and other modalities of prevention is that I, it, it's a promising new drug and I'm interested to, to expand a little bit on that, Roger, because we know from HIV you were instrumental in all the evidence generated on, on drug resistance. We know Viral Evolution Consortium has be, already been set up. I think we need to listen to all those modelers and, and ensure that a, a drug of this nature somehow becomes accessible, but it's used responsibly. So it's... Um, it's important to, to learn from previous epidemics that are still ongoing and, and what we already, I think, can predict of how this virus is behaving. And so 
I guess it's not really a question, but a, a bit of a loaded uh, viewpoint. Thanks, Roger. You're welcome. So, are you, are you, um, Natalie? Are you exploring also um, new uh, antiviral drugs like like the Pfizer drug? Are you thinking about that as well? So, so we're exploring. First, we're looking with our discovery team. We're looking at combination of antivirals because we really think we need to look at you know um, having some evidence that this would work. And of course, we are interested in looking at aspects of those drugs and see how what should be combined, and then yes, try to combine them. Absolutely. Okay, and any chance of like a cheap monoclonal or something like that? So cheap monoclonal, I mean, this we would ask, we need to ask others, but cheap is not enough. We need cheap and sub -Q. So yeah. you know that there are some that are being developed, so let's see what happens. There are groups like uh, IAVI who are looking at the, at the cheap uh, affordable uh, monoclonals for COVID, mm -hmm. and we have to continue to follow up on this. And, and, one, and one final and quick question. I mean, are there equivalents to fluoxamine? Are you exploring other, other drugs that with similar mechanisms of action? We are, we, we are so it's, it's not official yet. So, but uh, we are going to look at fluoxetine because there's a lot of data showing, yesterday there was a publication on a retrospective study showing that fluoxetine has had a very protective effect. And this is why I said bench to bench to bench to bed. Because looking at retrospective data, it seems it's been protecting elderly patients to get severe COVID, okay. uh, to be hospitalized, to have to be intubated. But also now we have much more evidence on the, on the, um, on the plasma related effect. And there was a study, very interesting new model on an ex vivo model with amitriptyline, showing that you could clear the virus with uh, treating healthy volunteers with amitriptyline. Um, so it's, it's quite a new, interesting model, so promising, but, you know, let's wait for the data. Okay, so thank you very much, Natalie. Wonderful talk and really huge effort, very important effort to, to bring drugs to, to re also resource limited settings. So thank you very much for your participation. Now we'll give the floor to Jens, Jens Lundgren. Jens is, uh, in addition to a good friend and an honor to, to have him here. Um, uh, he's professor, a senior consultant, academic chair and director. I have infectious diseases at the Riggs Hospital uh, in, in Copenhagen. He has been absolutely instrumental in, in the knowledge and the clinical knowledge of HIV. Uh, he has probably authored almost half of the papers or the key papers that are, are there somehow. And, and also he now he's being, um, he's leading all the efforts, the NIH uh, funded efforts to find new uh, antivirals for hospitalized patients uh, together with Jim Neaton in the University of Minnesota. And we are all very proud and happy to work with him under his leadership um, because this, his, the clinical trials are really uh, amazingly well done. And, and, and moving forward the, 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 the field. Um, so thank you very much, Jens, if you want to, to go ahead. Thank you very much, Moshe, and also to Natalie for a wonderful talk, uh, really important work that you're doing, Natalie. So my angle is just to review very briefly here in 15 minutes uh, where we are with uh, some of the newly developed antivirals uh, for COVID. Um, uh, probably not for this audience, uh, uh, you need a, a, a deep introduction, but just to remind that there's essentially three classes of antivirals uh, in development or have been shown to be effective, the fusion inhibitors, the protease inhibitors, and the pro polymerase inhibitors. And there's uh, different drugs uh, in, uh, for all three classes uh, that have shown to be clinically uh, effective. Um, um, <clears throat> of course, the, the, the first observation done very early on was the, the spike protein uh, and the binding of spike protein to ACE2 uh, uh, receptors on host cells and an ability to try to prevent that finding by neutralizing antibodies. Of course, this is the key uh, mechanism of action of, of uh, vaccines, uh, where the body's own immune system is producing neutralizing antibodies. But also there was a number of monoclonal antibodies uh, developed that specifically target uh, and prevents this uh, fusion uh, from happening. 
um, these uh, the epitopes for these uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, are, are now well characterized and resides both in the receptor binding domain and the motif in there, uh, as well as for some of them also outside of the RBD, but within the spike uh, protein. Uh, I've tried to summarize uh, neutralized monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, and studies uh, prior to hospitalization. This has really been the, the breakthrough in the last three or four months uh, that phase three trials has been completed uh, that demonstrate uh, reduced risk of, of the disease if you use the, them uh, either as pre-exposure uh, pre prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis uh, um, with a rate of reduction in relative terms from between 60 to 80 uh, percent. But also, if you treat people uh, with early COVID uh, uh, and prior to hospitalization, again, you see a marked reduction uh, of the risk of progression to uh, need of hospitalization and eventually death. Uh, you can see also that the trials are, have a very large sample size, um, um, uh, are well done. Uh, I think the other aspect to really emphasize here is that all of these trials were done by the companies who developed the monoclonals, except for the latter one here, Active 2, which started a um, combination of two monoclonals from a uh, biotech company called Bi uh, Bree. Uh, so that's the only academically conducted uh, trial. Uh, um, um, this is just one example of from one of the trials here showing uh, a reduction in hospitalization. If you give uh, a combination of two monoclonals early on in COVID uh, uh, compared to placebo. Of course, here it is of key importance to notify and be observant that the disease progression in the placebo group was around 6%, uh, something I'll come back and just discuss briefly. Uh, as you know, we just discussed the resistance. Uh, we know that the virus develops resistance against uh, the various monoclonals, in particular, the first one, uh, BAM or BAM, little bit developed by Lilly. Uh, there's multiple of the virus strains uh, that have already developed full resistance against that. Uh, um, there's others, in particular, combinations of, uh, of uh, monoclonals uh, that have a preserved activity also with the currently circulating uh, Delta uh, strain. We just discussed uh, the protease and polymerase uh, inhibitors in early COVID. Just to summarize here, uh, we recently heard from Pfizer on their uh, Ritonavir boosted uh, protease inhibitor 332, uh, a reduction in uh, hospitalization when used in early uh, infection from 7% in placebo to 0.8%. Um, and also, as was just referred to in the MOVAUC study, uh, on uh, monopiravir uh, versus placebo, um, you can see that more people in placebo uh, in active treatment uh, experienced disease progression, although that was lower, 7% versus 14% in placebo. We also recently heard uh, from, uh, from Gilead uh, that uh, um, remdesivir used uh, and studied initially in hospitalized patients essentially had the same effect of around an 80 uh, percent in relative 80 to 90 percent in relative uh, reductions um, by using active agent versus placebo so it's quite clear that if you inhibit viral replication either by uh, fusion inhibitors polymerase inhibitors protease inhibitors you essentially is reducing the risk of disease uh, progression um, in early disease of course, the challenges uh, with uh, using uh, these therapies uh, is, is that the rate of disease progression in the placebo group uh, uh, is, is, is a single digit, uh, six to eight uh, percent. So therefore, the numbers need to treat for one to benefit uh, is in the range between 10 and 15. So you need to treat a lot for one to benefit. Um, uh, and obviously that serves uh, as a key focus point of uh, developing better predictors of, uh, of risk of disease progression uh, so we can get those uh, numbers uh, further down. Uh, it obviously requires early diagnosis um, um, and certainly for the monoclonals uh, infusion, which takes around 30 to 60 minutes uh, plus a two hour observation period. Uh, 
and I obviously forgot. And Natalie, you reminded me I should have cost, uh, put in cost as well uh, as a predicament here. Now, for hospitalized patients, uh, the first drug uh, that was uh, uh, shown to be clinically effective uh, was remdesivir. Uh, uh, the treatment effect, as you can see from uh, this insert here, uh, it was demonstrated in people with COVID pneumonia uh, prior to developing uh, COVID ARDS. Uh, um, and there's recent findings to support uh, that observation, also using various biomarkers uh, of viral replication uh, uh, that, um, that the antiviral efficacy, although it is pretty modest, uh, um, are seen uh, uh, prior to development of COVID ARDS. Um, uh, for neutralizing antibodies for hospitalized patients with COVID, uh, uh, the situation has been much more tricky. Uh, and it has essentially been left to academic networks to uh, uh, identify a possible niche of neutralizing antibody uh, in hospitalized patients. Uh, the issue here is that we know in, once people get sent to the hospital, the immune system uh, is starting to kick in. Uh, so more, some people uh, hospitalized have more virus than others. Uh, this depends on immune status and those who have viral control, but is uh, is uh, suffering from immune hyperreaction uh, are quite unlikely to uh, respond to antivirals, uh, whereas people um, who have not yet mounted antibody response uh, uh, to the virus uh, have essentially an uncontrolled infection that leads to their hospitalization and pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> The other issue is that the anatomic location where virus replicates move from the upper to the lower airways uh, and beyond, and there is only uh, emerging biomarkers to assess the full body viral replication. Um, of course, the idea here is to reduce risk of additional disease progression and accelerate the recovery uh, among people who are hospitalized. Um, the very impressive recovery trial that you know, I'm sure you all have heard of uh, that uh, Peter Horby uh, and colleagues in the UK have been conducting ever since the start of the pandemic. Recently in June released the preprint uh, uh, demonstrating <clears throat> that the, um, one of the cocktails and monoclonals from Regeneron uh, in, among hospitalized patients, uh, uh, the mortality rate was similar for usual care uh, compared to those who received the, the antibody. Uh, but quite strikingly, uh, once you uh, dichotomize the cohort, depending on whether they had already mounted an antibody response uh, in the lower part or, or have not yet mounted an antibody response, you see that there is a, an apparent treatment benefit 20% reduction in mortality in those who were seronegative, whereas uh, the opposite was actually true with a slight increase in mortality for those who received the monoclonal uh, compared to usual care uh, if people had already raised an antibody response. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Roger was just mentioning, uh, uh, we were asked by NIH to form a global trial network uh, back in May last year. Uh, this is known as uh, Actor 3, also known as TICO, uh, um, was able to bring in various uh, networks, existing uh, networks. The Insight Network was chosen to be the lead, but also involving collaboration with the US, uh, the VA, uh, as well as two uh, um, ARDS networks from National Institute, uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the Pedal Network, and CTSN uh, to bring in a global consortium uh, of trials. Um, the idea here was that we would want to position clinical trials around the world, you know, which would then allow us to uh, maintain a steady recruitment irrespective of the waves of the pandemic over the ensuing uh, uh, now one and a half year. Uh, and this has been shown to be a really effective instrument. This is as far as we have uh, gone with the first five studies. Uh, again, uh, of note here, these uh, for trial one and two, uh, these were studies uh, in the outpatients done by the company, but we took it on as an ac academic group. Uh, um, 
uh, in the first three trials of three monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, we stopped the, the trials early because of futility. Uh, none of them had a clinical benefit overall, so very consistent with recovery. The false monoclonal from uh, AstraZeneca uh, is still uh, blinded, uh, and we have fully recruited that study. Uh, um, and we have also now studying a DARPIN uh, um, molecule uh, as well that I won't discuss here. Um, one thing that we have done in the cohort is to uh, characterize the patients for whether they have mounted an antibody response or not, have focused on uh, uh, this assay from GeneScript, uh, which is a surrogate for neutralizing uh, uh, antibodies who, who is present. Uh, uh, quite strikingly, uh, if you take the first three cohorts uh, from TICO uh, and dichotomize them, depending on whether they have already developed antibodies uh, to this, uh, uh, using this assay or not, uh, um, quite strikingly, if you look at the bottom here, uh, uh, plasma antigen, which is a very sensitive uh, uh, nuclear uh, capsid antigen assay, uh, uh, which is positive in most of hospitalized patients. You see that if you have already mounted antibodies against RBD, the plasma antigen levels uh, are, are substantially lower compared to people uh, who have not yet uh, done so. Uh, so 329 versus 2297. Um, <laughs> So based on that, uh, we projected that although the overall uh, uh, effect was neutral, uh, that there would be a potential benefit of neutralizing monoclonal antibodies in people who have not yet mounted the antibody response, and in particular, if they have uncontrolled viral replication with the plasma antigen as a surrogate of that. And indeed, once we uh, either dichotomize, depending on the two biomarkers, or, or do four uh, subgroups, uh, uh, we see a at least a sign of a potential benefit in those who have not yet mounted antibody response but have high plasma antigen levels. The issue here is uh, that uh, we have been studying safety, which I think is a critical component, of course, of any uh, randomized trials, and have started to sh see uh, also that there is a dichotomization uh, of safety outcomes here defined as uh, death, uh, serious adverse events, organ failure, or serious co-infection during 90 days of follow-up. And where you can see that among people who is uh, at entry anti-RPD positive, you see an excess risk uh, in those um, who were treated with uh, active agent versus placebo, uh, whereas you see the opposite in those who is antibody uh, negative. Uh, uh, so this suggests a potential harm signal uh, in people uh, if they are receiving monoclonals uh, and being hospitalized. Similarly, if you just look at mortality, again, you see the same signal here uh, of a, a potentially excess risk of mortality if you are RBD uh, antibody positive, uh, whereas there is a, a supposed uh, a slight protection if you are negative, uh, consistent with the recovery trial. So in summary, um, Antiviral therapy is used prophylactically or in early disease, reduces risk of disease progression. I think that's a, a clear observation here. There's probably not going to be too many additional placebo-controlled trials to, uh, for other agents um, in that setting here, uh, whereas the benefit of antivirals in patients hospitalized uh, remains more uncertain. There are two trials indicating benefit of neutralizing monoclonals among seronegatives, but potential harm in seropositives. Uh, uh, it appears that, that polymerase inhibitors may reduce risk of further disease progression in patients with COVID pneumonia, uh, but not those with COVID ARDS. Uh, and then there's also uh, emerging data from uh, one of the protease inhibitors, the one from Merck, uh, uh, that in this setting, uh, uh, this protease inhibitor did not have uh, any clinical uh, benefits. Uh, so on that note, I just want to thank a lot of people who's been involved with Active 3 uh, uh, over the last one and a half years. It's been a mammoth uh, global effort to uh, be able to recruit over 3,000 patients into the study. Thank you, Roger.
Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. We have we have time for a couple of questions again. If if Natalie or Sergio want to to make a question, please feel free. Uh, so I will start with a uh, uh, couple of questions from the from our audience. The first one, Jens, is: Do we have an idea of whether antiviral treatment dampens the natural anti-COVID immune response and thus makes a person more vulnerable to second COVID infection? We have been studying that in the follow-up uh, for hospitalized patients. I have not yet seen uh, that there's any signs of blunted response compared to placebo patients. Um, so the preliminary answer is no, but we obviously need to study that more carefully. Okay, thank you very much. So then another question, antibodies or other antivirals have limited clinical impact on infected individuals. This is a statement from one of our audience. Do we know their impact as prophylaxis in highly susceptible individuals? So I think you have that. Yeah, I've shown that. Yeah, so it's, it's clearly working. Uh, but it's the numbers need to to benefit that is the problem, uh, depending on the risk, the underlying risk of disease progression. So the more high risk, uh, the lower the numbers need to, to benefit the low become, of course. I have one final question, Les, uh, Sergio, because we don't have more time. Sergio or Natalie, you want to ask any, any question? I have one last question. No. Maybe I first thank you, Jens, for this brilliant presentation. I'm what is your, your views on, on, on vaccination and enrolling in clinical trial and, and understanding the efficacy? It's been a debate. Uh, no, it's a very valid debate, and in particular in hospitalized patients, uh, because we have this uh, safety signal in seropositives, and obviously the vaccines that's inducing antibodies against spike. Uh, so that's a clearly open question that we need to address. Uh, we have uh, uh, one final study, uh, two final studies that we are now looking into uh, where around 30% is vaccinated. Uh, so we'll be able to give experimental evidence uh, to inform that discussion. But uh, I agree with you, most of the trials done so far are essentially in cohort to patients who haven't been vaccinated yet. So, so that's an open question, how to deal with uh, using monoclonals in hospitalized patients uh, if you are vaccinated already. Um, so biomarkers is going to be key in that respect. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. We don't have more time for, for questions, so we will move. Thanks a lot, Jens. Uh, we'll move to Sergio. Sergio Carmona is also another good friend. He's now uh, a, he's the chief medical officer of the FIND organization who looks for diagnostics for all. Previously, he, um, he spent over a decade in the National Health Laboratory Service in South Africa, uh, where he ran all sorts of molecular diagnostics and we we had the chance to collaborate with resistance aspects and now he's he's now working for find in, in geneva so thank you very much sergio if you want to to go ahead i'm sure we will enjoy very much your talk <music>
the forefront of, of political leaders and 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 many of those who um, call for action, advocacy, etc. Um, early on in the pandemic, the Director General uh, called for a very clear message: test, test, test. It's all we had for many, many months. And vaccines and therapeutics came a, a little later. <clears throat> so <clears throat> early on in about the April in 2020, um, political leaders as well as public health leaders convened um, a meeting to organize many players. And this led to the um, launching of the access to COVID-19 tools and accelerating <clears throat> in April last year that was uh, focusing in ensuring equitable access to tests, treatments and, and vaccines globally. This aimed to break the chain of transmission, enable target public health uh, interventions that were and treatment uh, that were based on evidence. Uh, of course, continue informing uh, epidemiological surveillance for acting. And later on, we were also um, confronted with variants uh, and that needed to be handled also quite swiftly. Gradually, um, the rollout of vaccines and now therapeutics uh, are becoming uh, um, more accessible and, and available. However, um, as we were saying early on in, in Jens' talk in Natalie's, uh, we're hugely concerned of, uh, on using monotherapies or not using the full arm of, of therapeutic options we have. It's a complicated disease, what to use early, what to use late, requires still uh, accurate diagnosis and, and uh, monitoring uh, what stages of the disease we are. So talking about leadership, uh, WHO together with many member states uh, put together this accelerator. Um, it's divided in, in three or four pillars. One that looks at vaccines, therapeutics, uh, a third one into diagnostics and the health system connector, which looks into health system strengthening. Um, Fine together with the Global Fund co-lead the diagnostic pillar, which has been focusing primarily on the access and acceleration of uh, tools uh, both molecular and uh, obviously because of our focus in low and middle income countries to uh, the launch and acceleration at scale of uh, good quality uh, and good performing uh, rapid antigen RDTs. There's uh, a whole ecosystems of both regulators, funders um, and implementing partners that make this possible. I want to also stop here for a moment because I think we sometimes forget uh, the time that normal things take in, in, in peace times. Roger, you and I have worked in HIV, things that took five, 10 years, bioinformatics for G NGS took us a few years. It's only been uh, a few months, uh, you know, since the uh, genetic sequence of, of, of the virus was made public um, from when WHO declared this uh, a pandemic of global proportions to the development of molecular test and subsequent rapid test regulatory approval. And uh, I know Natalia and I have lots of very strong conversations on, on how to even make these tools that are now available, uh, available in countries and where people need them most. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see what it took, for example, to develop this for a malaria rapid diagnostic text. Uh, never mind uh, that HIV self-testing already took a few years to develop. So um, it's a little pause to say, yes, we could have done better and uh, we should do better uh, looking into the future. But it's been an, an incredible uh, um, development and in, within record time. Um, now, in terms of the pipeline, uh, this is today's download from our website and we're already tracking over a thousand uh, uh, tests that can uh, lead to either direct uh, um, diagnosis of COVID through molecular testing or indirect through a detection of a, um, an antigen or a serology. And now, not all, uh, we are putting this out there because it's, it's a large pipeline, but as you can see, how many of these may or not available in, con in some continents where we work or have uh, uh, received a stringent regulatory approval, filters is down to a few. Uh, in terms of antigen RDTs, there are currently, I think, four, uh, uh, listed in the WHO emergency use listing. So there's still quite a lot of work to be done to make these uh, um, uh, reviewed and approved and accessible. 
Um, again, talking about evidence, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but uh, already in March this year, uh, um, a systematic review looking at the performance of both uh, rapid point of care antigen as well as molecular based test uh, was um, published by the Cochrane uh, Library. Um, and you can, you're welcome to see the, uh, how that is tracking. Again, as many lessons learned both from therapeutics and vaccine that without a network of collaborators and sites and, and, and colleagues and friends, none of this is possible. Um, this is just an example of how did we it, uh, basically chase the epidemic both from the global north to the global south to generate evidence of performance of some of these assays. And um, we continue to hopefully work together with those in therapeutics and, and vaccines to ensure that in the future, this network is maintained and, and it's robust so that we can act quickly. Um, um, again, uh, there's lots on our website that you're welcome to see them in the interest of time. I'm just gonna go quickly. Uh, uh, not only we were looking at how this uh, pipeline was developing, but also um, ease of use and, and making sure that different sample types uh, that could be used uh, had um, independent evidence of uh, performance. And initially, most of the tests were retropharyngeal, some we tested saliva, oral fluids, and, and nasal um, sampling as well. You can see here both the development of these technologies as well as performance, which varied. Um, the emergence of variants uh, challenged all of this. We quickly ran back to see what genomic sequences were maybe missed with the assays that were already implemented. But as you know, Roger, we've been working both in HIV and TV with the uh, aim to scale up the use of uh, new uh, next, generation, next generation sequencing um, initially for surveillance and in TV, in this case, through a unit aid grant for individual tailoring of, of drugs. Thanks to what had been developed for the response to other epidemics, we were fairly well positioned, at least at the beginning, to see, um, uh, to track the, the variants uh, of concerns uh, that were uh, emerging in South Africa, Brazil, India, et cetera, and in, in Europe. And um, most, it's a complex set of technologies, as you know, uh, the idea here is to make them simple or, or at least the workflow to be more amenable and scalable. Um, and again, uh, it was important to see how uh, this uh, infrastructure already um, was uh, in place or existing and what were the gaps uh, that needed to be addressed. Um, together with funding and much support from many uh, in WHO and other regions, together with the Rockefeller Foundation, we started to um, assess the um, availability and, and strength in certain areas and, and gaps uh, that existed uh, for um, genomic surveillance of, of NGS. And again, there's lots of details that we can share and available on our sites. Um, let me skip some of that in, in the interest of, of time and, and look at uh, other aspects that made our work possible. Again through collaborations with academic institutions, uh, modelers from different groups, uh, we've been able to uh, quickly assess what are um, modelers telling us about how the virus is behaving, the uh, possible phenotypic changes, as well as uh, the need for, um, in, again, in diagnostic, what would be the best combination of molecular versus rapid test? What can we gain? What do we lose? Um, especially with the focus that in many low-income in, uh, countries, access to molecular testing is still way, way uh, uh, too limited. So um, together with uh, groups from, from here at FIND and, and collaborators, we looked at modeling that, and, and here you can see um, how we assess both the benefit of receiving a, a result that is actionable within a limited point uh, time versus a molecular test that is a lot more accurate and may be less clinically relevant because it doesn't really uh, equate to transmission. So there's already not only our evidence, but from other groups that having a result sooner is better than an accurate result that comes much later. And the frequency of testing is important. Again, uh, access and pricing uh, makes this fairly limiting uh, in other settings. 
So preparing for the future, and I've got just uh, uh, limited time. I, I would uh, uh, address it in three ways. One, we need a, a strong public health leadership. And if we consider le leadership here as a process of social influence, which maximizes the effort of others towards the achievement of a clear goal, we have a clear goal. We all want to uh, have contained this virus. We need to maximize the efforts and, and building partnerships and, and ensuring that we uh, are able to work together with those who are develop, uh, setting up clinical trials for vaccines or therapeutics will certainly uh, expedite uh, our efforts in diagnostics. And I don't need to go into details about what social influence or advocacy can do, both in a positive and, and maybe negative way too, without uh, being well informed. And an example of this public health leadership is uh, the call for the 100 day mission from the G7. It kind of crystallizes and tracks what we did uh, and how long it took us to develop at, at, at scale uh, at diagnostic. And how can we be better prepared in the future is a roadmap that we're busy working with CEPI and others to see um, what we learned and how can we, if you want, um, uh, contain that response within 100 days. And it is possible if we have, as I mentioned earlier, some of the other things aligned. Um, I'll leave that uh, for another time. Two would be accelerate access to game-changing technologies. Uh, I think we've pointed out what's happened with therapeutics and vaccines, uh, AI, machine learning, uh, access to mobile devices and connecting individuals quickly being able to track all these early warning indicators up to public health uh, um, leaders so that we can uh, address and contain uh, viral spread. Um, next generation technologies like NGS and CRISPR are already uh, starting to emerge. It's now a matter of ensuring that they are available at scale and they're robust enough for uh, the settings where we work. And, and again, um, as we did with HIV, self-testing and ensuring that we have uh, the ability for individuals to take care of their own health uh, and, um, and without necessarily lockdowns, but containing uh, the, the spread within uh, households or workplaces is, is key. Um, and then the last point would be uh, dig the digitalization of diagnostics. So having point of care diagnostics or any of these very, uh, um, uh, you know, complex uh, systems, including assays that can look at neutralizing antibodies or functional immunity. So from rapid antigen RDTs that are available in communities all the way to NGS, without this uh, being the data and protected data available for re uh, actionable uh, public health measures, it's, it's pointless. So um, those would be my three key messages uh, for how we would probably address the pandemic and uh, in in the future, thanks, Roger. And that's it. Thank you very I much. I tried my best to keep it in time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you did. You did. Thank you very much, Sergio. I think that uh, I'm really enjoying this session a lot, and and it's a pity we will have to take some time from the lunch break. But I think we can. I'll, I'll take a, at, least, <laughs> at least a couple of a couple of minutes. Again, Natalie Jens, if you want to ask any any question, please uh, feel free. I think Jens, you have one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I certainly agree with the transformation of technologies has been really impressive, also in the diagnostic landscape. Uh, um, and um, you know, I've been quite intrigued with the with the antigen assays because they have the potential for being a point of care test, uh, although. Uh, maybe the compartment we are measuring them in so far from the nasal cavity is not the most optimal. Uh, and at least we are having some uh, some experience with measuring it with these very sensitive assays in, in plasma, which may be a helpful other avenue. Um, and I wonder how we can push that forward. Sure. I, I mean, one thing we know, and we know from what, what you know, that ultra-sensitive molecular assays may not necessarily mean uh, that we are actively shedding virus or, or virus that are um, viable and that can infect others. And there's been great work uh, already on that. And um, so, sure, and to, uh, the uh, more direct evidence of, of active or um, viable viruses are, are key. And um, again, what we grapple with is to ensure that these assays are sufficiently robust and scalable 
so that they can be effective in, in, in the cities where we work, but definitely um, worth considering. Yeah, thanks, Sergio. Really nice presentation. So I don't know what are your views. You know, the, the trick with COVID is that when we start seeing patients when they have symptoms, they probably have less chance of having positive tests. I mean, the further we go, the lower the chance. And so everything is, all efforts, as you said, is to detect early. So what else can we do than just having uh, the self-testing? So could we, are there, are there strategies to look at combined testing of, well, you know, the, the multi, the multiplex or others that could be deployed to wider range of patients, even, even if they don't yet have symptoms? What, what are the, uh, what are the next slide? What uh, strategies, yeah. Good question, Natalie. So it's, um, that leads me to some decision support tools. So one thing we can do is to, um, couple the uh, either the PCR or the antigen RDT with decision support tools. So, so these are digital support tools that help stratify. So it will give you a, a, a level of risk whether you have been exposed or not because of the community where you live or where you have been together with a degree of um, uh, working out symptomatology or not. Um, but without, um, any other subclinical evidence is quite hard because access to, you know, who do you provide this test to? And, and at low prevalence settings, the, the risk of false positive can also be detrimental. Now, there's evidence, for example, doing this kind of thing with healthcare workers that you know they're being highly exposed. And again, there could be PCR positive with, uh, you know, viral loads that are actually quite low and probably of clinical uh, relevance that is also quite low and doesn't help, uh, for example, taking them out of work. So it's also ensuring that we understand what diagnostic means in uh, in relation to to the virus life cycle and the clinical uh, presentation. So not every PCR that is positive is of um, if you weren't clinically relevant. It's a hard message to simplify, but um, we know this not only from COVID but but other diseases too. Um, then Sergio, I mean, and I will, I will make a, a, some criticism to our own public health um, okay. <laughs> politicians here, at least in Spain, is that for us, we've had the technology, and I think that will happen everywhere. So we've had the technology for sequencing. We know how to sequence the viruses. And, and, and this is actually nowadays is a no brainer. We spend some time, a lot of time, uh, possibly a decade thinking how to simplify bioinformatics, but bioinformatics nowadays are, are pretty straightforward. Now, what is, has become really difficult I, in our, at least in our setting, is to connect the dots. So connect the sequencing information with actually the public health information, actually the actionable public health information. And this is because everything is automated. Uh, it's, it's separated in different in different silos. And then politically, it's a little bit hard to to make people understand that we have to convert. So how how do you do that? <laughs> how how can that be done? So. Again, not, not new, right? We, we know that what patient identifiable data, clinical data, uh, together with informatics, one without the other is meaningless. Now, I would always argue that the benefit versus the risks uh, here are, are, are no brainer either, right? So the benefit, both for the sector of the economy that is just looking at health, but the broader sector, schools, uh, workplaces, etc., have also a role to play and advocate that there is certainly a benefit between able to access and share that data in a safe way uh, together with bioinformatics. Uh, once those two are together, uh, uh, the, the benefits of, of what the infrastructure you have in Spain and in many countries in Europe will be uh, certainly uh, potentially uh, uh, logarithmically a lot, lot more valuable. Um, so this is where my last point on, on what I meant by leadership and communities is that we can, as academics or institutions working in health, cannot work in isolation anymore from those who can help us advocate for access and understanding of what these uh, pieces of data mean or not, right? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's not this a problem for those who went to medical school anymore. We know how, what 
the two pieces of the puzzle uh, do and how important they are together. I think it's it's convincing others within the sectors uh, of the value. So, but never before has any disease been so politicized, oh. right? So any piece of data, it's obviously uh, uh, an indicator of how these countries were not ready for any pandemic response. So mm -hmm. uh, data is power in many sectors, not just in health. So I think Jens wants to make a remark. No, no, just wanted to, I mean, the, the resemblance on politicization between HIV and COVID is, is quite remarkable, right? Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of issues also using a more virality sequence data to contact chase and find the transmission chains also in HIV. Uh, so I think for, for both diseases, there's been a, a, a major layer of political sort of interference, uh, mm -hmm. but also a concern by the community about what do I do with my data if they become um, sort of shared with others? Can I maintain my privacy? Uh, and, uh, GDPR has really been, in, you know, having a negative influence on this as well, or, or at least a, a damping influence uh, on how to actually merge data into a single silo so you can use bioinformatics. Uh, but I certainly agree with Jose and Sergio that that should be the way forward once we have uh, ensured a secure way of actually combining data so we can use modern tools, uh, bioinformatic tools, more effectively as part of public health response. Um, I, I would like to add that now another challenge is that whenever we get this epidemic under control is to, to, to continue using the data. So all, all the infrastructure that we have generated for future uh, epidemics, but as well also for tracking other diseases like antimicrobial drug resistance or, or uh, other uh, bacterial outbreaks or stuff like that. I mean, we shouldn't go back. And this is just a, a comment from my own. Let me just finish with two questions from, from the audience, uh, like, which are very straightforward. So uh, I will ask both of them. So maybe you can answer them at the same time. So will new technologies for sensitive and rapid diagnostic, uh, the diagnostics reach as, uh, prices as low as current antigen tests? And the second one is what is the main characteristic we need to improve in next generation COVID tests compared to what we have? <laughs> really good questions. Um, pricing and, and uh, market shaping activities, I didn't uh, comment a lot into that. I mean, initially, uh, both uh, the countries that had um, the means uh, at the onset of the epidemic had power to buy and drove, as in any kind of market, the price up and left uh, countries without access behind. So the WHO consortium for uh, diagnostic was created to uh, exactly address that. Pricing uh, is driven by demand and also by the cost of goods. And um, I, I can spend a whole morning on that, but uh, and the aim would be to, to, to ensure, yeah, that right now that price is, is uh, accessible. And the other question was, uh, just remind me again, uh, on uh, what would it be, what would it take to make the, the assays, um, the next generation? Again, Jens, this reminds me of the different generations of HIV assays that we went through, I don't know, we're in fourth or fifth generation. Again, um, uh, it would it depends both on the host and, and the actual virus. Coronavirus and nucleocapsid is what we have mostly targeted to. Um, uh, more sensitive uh, readers, uh, detectors, there, there's a whole um, chemical engineering platform that makes uh, these assays more robust and sensitive, as well as the classic, you know, the capture and detection antibodies, the, the, um, the dynamics there would probably be, and, and as Natalie said, how do we couple them together with biomarkers that uh, I'll, um, reflect uh, current uh, infection or, or severity? Uh, I know in some countries, the use of CRP, IL-6, et cetera, uh, um, being investigated. So it's both direct uh, detection of the virus together with a, a marker of, of severity or active infection, I would say. Well, okay. So, no, I think we've we run out of time. So thank you very much, Sergio, Jens, Natalie. This was, I had a lot of fun personally, I have to admit. Uh, so I hope that your audience did too. Uh, I, I would, I, it was really a really great, a great session. It was great talking to you. So thank you very much. And I would like to remind the audience. So we will go into a lunch break. Um, 
We will reconvene at 13.30, at 1.30, with a, an excellent session on developing vaccines. Uh, please don't miss this session. It's, it's moderated by Adolfo Garcia Sastre. We'll have Caroline Reynolds, Chris Simas, and Mariano Esteban. It's going to be a lot of fun as well. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to see you soon. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.